Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California, you're listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ali Alanius. Hello and welcome back to another episode of your favorite social good podcast. We are here to serve you a couple things. Oh my goodness, I hope you are doing well today. I hope that you are embracing all that you are, even if it was a tough day, you know. Gosh, I remember those tough days. I remember days when I'm like, there has to be something better than this. You know the good news is? There is, <laughs> there always is. You know, on this show, we talk a lot about the survivors of trauma aspect. Not so much because we wanna stay there, but because I wanna celebrate your resilience, your ability, your capacity to overcome, even if you haven't seen it in the past. And so part of that journey is just the initial acknowledgement. You know, maybe I behave this way because of the traumas that I have endured, but the good news is, is we get to upgrade our belief systems. We get to um, become this evolution, you know, and in my case, I always say it has become my own revolution where I see things so differently now, you know, and all the people that we bring onto this podcast have incredible stories and do come on with, an, with the ability to offer you some sort of value. And yes, we talk on a variety of different subjects, but you know, it is important. It's important for you. And it's really actually important for me because then I know I'm fulfilling my purpose, which isn't just about sharing my story, but the very powerful story of others. Um, on that note, today, you know, we often, we actually recently uh, had the 9-11, 20 year anniversary. Um, this was a very significant occurrence for the United States for globally, but you know, definitely here. Everyone remembers 9-11. It was a day in our history, which you know we definitely remember uh, globally, but especially here in the United States. Similarly, coming up this month, we will be observing the 20th anniversary of another significant tragedy here, and that is the Sandy Hook Elementary shooting, which occurred on December 14, 2012, where a, an incident occurred that 20 first grade children were killed, including six educators. And I stutter over those words or stumble over them because, of course, at that time, I had one of my four children. My son was in first grade. And even though I wasn't there, just knowing that, it did traumatize me a bit. How do I feel safe taking my children to school, right? So going back to the 9-11 occurrence, this had to be uh, an amazing and I don't mean amazing and glorious, but it just had to be an amazing day for people who firsthand experienced it there in New York. Our guest is one such person, so this is kind of why I bring this up. How do we recover from such incredible trauma and move forward into the new space, into wholeness? So with that, I'm very excited to introduce him to you, and so we'll get started. Kushal Choksi's career as an analyst at Goldman Sachs was forever changed on September 11, 2001, as he made a split-moment decision to abandon his office and the co-workers who refused to leave the World Trade Center. Managing to narrowly escape, he witnessed the magnitude of death and destruction up close and was plunged into lengthy depression where he found himself believing life was meaningless. His search for a renewed purpose began with a reluctant trip to a breathwork workshop and eventually turned into a decades-long journey of spiritual discovery mind-blowing metaphysical experiences and a fierce devotion to the life-altering benefits of mindfulness and meditation. Author of On a Wing and a Prayer, Spiritually for the Reluctant, the Curious and the Seeker, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Kushal Chosi. <laughs> good afternoon, good afternoon. How are you? Thank you, Ali. I'm doing amazing. Thanks for having me. <laughs> To the people in the audience, I hope you are ready for an amazing adventure because um, I got to ask you, and I know I had said about 20 years. I, th I think as I'm getting older, I keep rounding numbers for myself. So my apologies, <laughs> but time keeps flying so fast, right? I mean, but it has been, you know, in, in two decades. What has hindsight given you from that day specifically? <clears throat> You know, that day perhaps was one of the most seminal events in my life um, in a most unsuspecting way. I never imagined or never thought uh, that an event like this would completely alter the course of my life. Um, and the reason I say most unsuspecting way is right after 9-11 or surviving that day, um, 
I didn't realize what had just happened. It was too much for me to process in that moment, of course, uh, let alone uh, even conceive that something like that could have happened to humanity. Um, but that sort of shook me up. And for the first time in my life, I asked that question, what was I really doing? Um, you know, it was the first time I perhaps class- the question the, the status quo of my life. Professionally, I was thriving. I was uh, working my dream job and I was moving up the ranks um, and, and kind of onto my path of that, that proverbial American dream. <laughs> but, uh, but somewhere something was missing and I had shoved it under the carpet um, in, in, that, in that mad dash for, for what I was chasing. And perhaps I'd even stopped asking why I was doing what I was doing. So it was this event that that kind of beckoned me to ask this question that perhaps there was more to life than what was in front of me than what met the eye. So it was a it was a beginning, or or I should say, a trigger uh, for what what was to follow. Right, a catalyst. It's incredible. I your words resonate with uh, someone of my background. Now that day and you know everything that you've just said i can't help but sometimes feel a little bit of similarities in the sense that we've just gone through a global pandemic we've gone through a global trauma and you have this huge what we call a great resignation of a lot of people that said to themselves you know what was i really doing i wrote it down that you said that because that is that moment in life and what more of a significant moment than that? Let me ask you just, you know, without focusing too much on that, because I want to give value. I mean, we know we, we were familiar. I was I remember that day distinctly um, calling into my friends who were in, you know, Manhattan and all of that. What what is it that you think or excuse me, actually, when when that moment came, your your office mates stayed and you were leaving you know, why didn't you stay? What was it that said, I'm going to take this route instead? Was there something? So it was specific? not actually my office mates, but it was the fellow commuters. So okay. my office was on the east side of Manhattan. And I was passing through World Trade Center on that day. I was in the North Tower when the first plane hit. Um, and of course, you know, initially, nobody had a clue what they were doing. That there, there was a pandemonium all around people. People were suspecting that a bomb had gone up, you know, just helter skelter, of course, ultimate chaos that I'd ever imagined or experienced in my life. Uh, now I was, it was all playing, uh, playing out in front of my eyes. And um, so I just thought I would just perhaps move away from this, not knowing what else to do. Um, and as I am going out, uh, right at the main entrance to the World Trade Center on Church Street, I clearly remember, there was this security person who was asking everyone to stay in or go back to their desks um, if you worked in the building because it was unsafe outside. You know, there was all these glass splinters and, and cement chips. It was just a virulent sort of haze outside. Um, and it was, it was asking people, just, just go in, go in. And, you know, in that moment, there was something um, that I just felt it was, it was not the right thing to go back in. And there was another voice that just said, you know, let's just go out. This is, this is not right. It's not safe to be in. Um, so I just followed that voice from behind and just, we just, you know, dashed out. Um, so it was one of that, that decisions that sometimes you think how a decision to do one way or the other, go left or right, can just completely alter the course of life. <laughs> Right. Um, so this was that one split decision for me that kind of put me in that another branch of the parallel universe. It's amazing how events happen like that, right? Because we can often say yeah. the same thing for positive ones as well. Well, if I, or like, you know, if I hadn't made that turn, I wouldn't have bumped into this woman and I wouldn't have married her. Or if I hadn't yes. gone to that, you know, <laughs> event, like all these things that are, our constant lives, I feel are maneuvered. We're just these you know, have you, the Avengers, the multiple uh, streams of versions of worlds that could exist depending on the decisions that we make must be incredible, yes. right? Um, okay, so 
and this is incredible. I mean, thank you for sharing that with us because I can really truly say that I, I with all empathy and I mean, I'm, I've been in a lot of situations, that's not one of them. And so, you know, with great respect and, and you know, it is, a, it is a good thing that we are here today. Did you ever, and I'm curious, you know, did you ever struggle with survivor's guilt? You know, yeah, I did not know the, that feeling or the term in that moment. You know, I, that, I did not know what a survivor's guilt was. Um, but I tell you one thing I, that I experienced. Um, it was a very interesting set of mixed feelings in my head at that point. A part of me was feeling very grateful, uh, very elated that I had made it out alive uh, against all odds, uh, I may say, um, and miraculously. <laughs> Um, so I was grateful for this new lease on life and I was, um, more, even more so determined to approach life, uh, with more gusto, with more enthusiasm and finish the unfinished business, if you will, that everything that I wanted to do, everything that was on my, um, invisible bucket list, if you will, I, I, I wanted to go after all that. Um, and part of me was also feeling, a little blah about it all. Um, part of me was thinking, yes, all that is great, but then what's the point of doing all these things? What if um, this could happen again and you're not so fortunate the next time? What do you do with all these things? What's the point? So there was this interesting kind of pull in, of two forces in, in diametrically opposite directions. Um, and I didn't know how to, how to deal with it. So while I did not have, you know, sort of a per se survivor's guilt, I had this very interesting mix of feelings that created some sort of void. And in that moment, I did not even know that it was a, it was a void that I was experiencing. I was just feeling like, what's this? You know, I, I've never experienced a feeling like this before where a part of me is feeling happy. The part, other part of me is saying, this can't be right. There's something missing. Right. There's, you know, so it was an interesting feeling to say the least. I love that you say that because <clears throat> I've often shared, I mean, when I, when I dealt, and I just want to share this because I think it's relevant to what you're saying. When I went through my health challenges and a lot of my friends passed, in fact, the first year that I battled cancer, seven of my peers in my cancer community passed away. And I did struggle with survivorship guilt. Uh, they were mothers like me. They had children that they wanted to go kiss at night. And so I say that to say, once I moved past the survivorship, I moved into, well, you know, I know that if they were here, they would be kicking ass at life. I know that if they were here, they would be embracing it. So why do I want to waste time that others wish they had? Had. And I feel that that for, you know, is what, ha you know, we've got, you've got a health challenge, you have a, a, a trauma like uh, the World Trade Center is being attacked and you've been there and, and everything else that happened 9-11 in general. So, you know, and, 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 and then how it affects the community. So I guess that begs the question. So how did you deal with it? And please, you know, share with us the wisdom, because I love that you're about breath work. I think people fail so often to understand the modalities available to us to find healing, spiritual growth, and really just freaking blow the hell off of life's wheels, right? So tell yeah. me, what was your process like? You know, I my process actually started from my deepest conditioning of my own mind, which was kind of to distract myself. You know, I, I had this feeling of void or a feeling of confusion or a feeling of I don't know what's going what's going on. And um, I didn't know how to deal with it. So I started doing things that I, I knew in that moment, which was, you know, to, to, do, to travel the world, um, to, to change careers, to find some, some joy, some fulfillment there, um, to do uh, adventurous things and thinking that, yeah, this would perhaps give me the, the high that I'm looking for. And every time I would do something, of course, it would bring that momentary respite and then i would come back feeling exhausted thinking no but this was not it maybe there is more and so i would raise the bar and and i would do something even more crazier the next time um and so i kind of persisted in that in that funk if you will where i was just constantly trying to distract myself uh, and looking backwards perhaps i was just trying to i was not ready to face what i was you know experiencing in that moment so i was just constantly finding joy in something out there. And in that moment, you know, I tried to meditate, I tried to read, and it was all okay, but 
it was not making any sense. I was feeling um, the, the, there's all these books that talked about being in the present moment, don't think of past, don't think of future. But I struggled to be, in, be present. How do you really do it? Was there a formula for it? Was there, I could definitely not read about it and do it. Um, not, it all made beautiful intellectual sense, a concept, but there was no experience. And so I struggled with all that until one afternoon I was invited to a session in Manhattan um, where this spiritual master, Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, was traveling from India. And I was very averse to this whole concept of gurus, to the whole concept of breathwork. And again, this is early 2000, right? Mm -hmm. There's not enough awareness about breathwork. There are no smartphones yet, so no apps that talk about it. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's a very different era where there's you know, yoga is just starting up and, you know, this people thought meditation, breath work, all these things is for uh, time when you are done with the life. Yeah. Or a retire. lot of people consider it very woo woo. I get that. Very oh, woo -woo. Woo -woo. I, and I was one of them. <laughs> Me from 20 years ago was I, exactly one of them. I thought perhaps this is, you know, this would, this would take an edge off me. You know, it, it's, I'm not ready to, to give up on, on my life right now and, and kind of do all these things. Um, you know, I, I have so much more to achieve. Uh, this is perhaps something, a pursuit for retirement, which I'm not ready for. Yeah. So I, I right. resisted from all angles. But, you know, sometimes, somehow, you know it. There's an invisible hand in creation that kind of pushes you. The same hand that perhaps pushed me out of the World Trade Center that day I, I said, you know, kind of, it pushed me on that afternoon to the session. And um, as I experienced that, that day with uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, that first time, that breath work, that meditation that I experienced, it felt like there was something in it that I was looking for. for the first time ever I'd experienced a state of mind without turbulence. Mm -hmm. I experienced that calmness. Um, and like how you said, I was still very guarded. I thought, is that some sort of woo? -woo? Is that some sort of placebo did i fall asleep so i was not ready to embrace it right away because this my training this wall street trained brain will not accept anything on its face value right away so i started researching about it and the more i researched the more i found the actual scientific underpinnings of this process this uh, technique sky breath meditation and i was even more convinced that there's perhaps something in it that I'm looking for because I tried, I had tried everything else. I tried it in, in careers. I tried it in relationships. I tried it in, um, in travel, in food. I tried it everywhere else and it had not delivered. So I'm like, okay, this is one place I have not tried yet. So what's the worst that can happen? Maybe I'll go down that path, find a dead end and come back uh, just like every other pursuit. So maybe, you know, let me just give it a shot. And that's how reluctantly I just stumbled upon this and, and started going down that path. I love it. And I, I, <laughs> I smiled when you said the Wall Street brain because, you know, it, my husband and I deal a lot with uh, major investors in film. We deal with a lot of people who manage funds. I know you've managed billions of dollars. And, you know, he, you, we're, we're being quite humble about your professional background, I know. But to the audience, you, you know, so so it's funny because in my head, I'm like, yeah, that Wall Street brain that says if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. Because, you know, usually when somebody's like, what's the worst that could happen? Well, you could lose some significant money and that's a lot. But I love that you say that. And I love that through your own process, you found that. So let me ask you, do do you feel that somebody has to really be ready? Like, is that one of the key components of truly unlocking, you know, those those secrets for yourself, the secrets of the universe? To me, everything that you speak on is is scientific. It is the universal laws, even down to for whatever reason that you weren't you weren't you were not led into that building on that day because you were not done. And ultimately, I feel like we attract what we need and what we are to the universe, not always what we want. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so, so going back to the question, I mean, do, do you feel that that's one of the keys? A person really has to be ready. I don't know about readiness because I don't think in our ability we can ever perceive or we can ever ascertain that, oh, yes, now I'm ready. Because there's no definition, there's no playbook for that readiness anywhere. But I tell you, one has to be willing. One has to be 
either willing or be desperate. Willing to try something new or desperate to say, you know, I've tried everything and it's not in here. Right. So that perhaps that process of um, negation could come handy. That right. no, it's not here, not here, not here, not here. And so perhaps, perhaps this is one thing that I've not tried. And so maybe let me go down this rabbit hole and see how deep it goes. So yeah, that was my, my part. That was my process. That was my journey. I love it. I love it. I love that, uh, you know, it's, it's takes us into the thread of spirituality. And I love that you focus specifically on people who are resistant. And I love, you know, I think that that was perfect the way that you said that, because it is, I mean, maybe that is the, you know, a version of ready. Yeah, I'm on rock bottom with this. I've lost everything that I love or whatever it is, your back is against the wall. And you are just like, I have no other options. Now I'm really willing, really willing to take a look at this. Um, Spirit. And it's unfortunate that you need to go through such events for Agreed. to have that kind of evolved um, thinking. I mean, life is so fast, right? I mean, day to day, we are constantly thinking about how am I going to, you know, make my ends meet? How am I going to send my kids to college? How, how am I going to, you know, get to the next level in my career? Probably planning the next vacation. In all this, we never put ourselves on our list, right? We're always chasing things around us, outside us. But whether it's a 9-11 for me, uh, or let's take an example of a pandemic that we are just coming out of. I mean, why do we need to go through? I mean, and this is the question I ask myself. That why do we need to go through such events only to, 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 to ask bigger questions? Right. <laughs> why, why can't we just wake up one morning and say, you know, um, okay, why don't I think where I'm going, where I'm headed with my life? It's only when something, you know, like a club is hit, you, somebody hits you with that club in your back of your head, and then it says, you wake up and with that shooting pain and says, oh no, there has to be something more than this. Right. <laughs> right. You know, and you're, you're so right. And it's interesting because 9 11 and like the pandemic, similar to the pandemic, you know, a lot of people are making changes now. Could have. I remember distinctly after 9 11, I was actually managing in San Francisco, right next to Candlestick Park, a uh, pharmaceuticals research company. Uh, and the when everything happened, we developed business resumption plan suddenly, mm. you know, because suddenly that became critical. Why we didn't have it before, you know, didn't like you say, why didn't we ha why are we not? We have the the wherewithal to be prepared for things that we're going to face in life, yet we often don't. So, you know, I really <laughs> I can appreciate that when we talk about um, spirituality, like I love one of the questions I have for you, how experiencing trauma and tragedy can make you, you know, how does it make you more receptive to a new spiritual journey? I mean, it kind of opens you up to trying different things. You know, in my case, I was just, it, it woke me up to thinking there had to be more to life than, right. than what I'm going through that perhaps I, you know, I need to, uh, I need to experience more uh, juice or or more fulfillment in my life and and perhaps you know all the things that i've tried don't don't provide it so you know maybe so, something like that can be a trigger point and i've seen in my life you know people go either ways you know a trigger point can either i either throw you to the to the deep uh, in the deep end of the pool and then you sometimes you know if if the circumstances around you are such, you could kind of start trying different substances to, to try and get out of it. Or you could be lucky and you stumble upon something life-changing and, and that kind of, you get onto to, to that roller coaster and that takes your life entirely into a completely different direction, which I was, I was fortunate enough to, to get onto that path. But I guess something like this just is, a, in my opinion, just a trigger. Right. It's, it just provides uh, that little um, moment to, to, to take a pause, reflect, perhaps take a stock of life and say, all right, I'm here. What's next? Is that all to life right now that, that I've done in this last 20, 30 years? Right, right. Okay, so I have a question then on that, which is um, 
define spirituality for me according to like how you see it. And I'm only saying this because, you know, a lot of people, I, I find people whenever you ask, uh, you know, what religion are you? You know, not that I go around asking everybody their religion, but sometimes it comes up and it's like, oh, okay, well, religion are you? And then they'll just say, you know, it's, I'm spiritual. But I find, you know, like many things that everyone defines it a bit differently. I mean, what to you is you know, or what do what is conventionally traditionally recognized, or excuse me, conventionally recognized as spirituality? And does that is that what you believe as well? Like, you know what I mean? I mean, if you ask me, it's just truly connecting with your own self, and perhaps being natural in every circumstance, being yourself, like kids. I think kids are deeply spiritual. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, I, they are so in the moment. I mean, I don't think spirituality has to do with meditating in a cave or reading some you know heavy books and 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 scriptures from thousands of years ago and and kind of practicing some you know deep form of yoga that can help you twist yourself into the shape of a pretzel no all that is not spiritual spirituality is just being natural spirituality to me is just you know not not moving through life without feeling stuck without kind of you know just just navigating with ease. To me, I think that's an that's spirituality. That's being spiritual. And when you connect with yourself at a deeper level, when you you really know who you really are, I think that just becomes so effortless. That's another thing. Spirituality doesn't have to be about putting effort. It's just about trying hard. It's we all I think are naturally so spiritual. It's just about you know uncovering that understanding, that 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 layer of deep conditioning that we all carry with us. Let me ask you some of the deep conditioning things that you struggled with personally or that you early on recognized. Again, I had mentioned it, you know, I, I talk about the upgrading our belief systems. Uh, me, I am a multicultural background. I completely know why I was told to grow up, get a law degree or do something, you know, get a job, retire, get the 401k, all of that, you know, go be this, you know, even and the one thing I will say for my family is there wasn't, you know, like, because you're a woman, you can't do anything. But they were like, yeah, be a CEO. They were never like, you know, it was just there was expectations. Do you know what yes. I mean? So what were some of the things that kept you from being spiritual that you re recognize were some of those um, belief systems or, or ideas? I think something very similar to what you've, uh, you just mentioned. I mean, my conditioning was uh, as an immigrant to, to go to um, a further shores, um, become materially successful, um, achieve everything that, that one can in life. Um, you know, just seeing success or, or kind of a very different imagina imagination or understanding of success. And, and a city like New York or working on Wall Street further fueled that, right? Um, it, it was just thinking, okay, fine. You know, on, on Wall Street, that's such an alpha culture where success begets more success. And most of the time it's evaluated um, through what you see around us, it's material success. So perhaps that was my understanding of uh, what I wanted to do and where I saw myself 20, 30, 40 years down the road. Um, and everything I did early on in my life kind of revolved around that. And so when somebody said, go breathe or, or adopt meditation, I always thought it was anti my belief. It was anti... Uh, what I was here to do, uh, that, as I said earlier, that perhaps to to meditate, one has to give up on all the aspirations, all the desires, all the worldly pursuits, uh, become perhaps uh, a monk and go to a cave and meditate. And I was not ready to do that because I thought, you know, I, I had a bigger aspiration in front of me and I was not ready for that yet. So my conditioning uh, was kind of that kept me away from this this sort of taking a deep dive into the inner dimension. Um, you know, we, we always say like we have these two dimensions, this outer dimension, where, which is our bank balance, our cars we drive, the homes we live in, our relationships, even this physical body. Right. And everything we do, most of the time, effort and energy that we spend is in nurturing this outer dimension. Mm -hmm. But the inner dimension is who we really are, that, that space, that headspace, that state of mind, um, that no matter where you are uh, can make you feel differently. 
And so my conditioning kept me anchored into this outer dimension. Um, it was only when I discovered, you know, meditation that I, that I became aware that there was this entirely different dimension that I'd never explored. I love that. I love that. You know, I talk about and I know what you mean, you know, the flow, the flow. I talk about walking around in life like I'm John Wick. And it's only ironic because I actually do know Keanu Reeves. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but walking like the Matrix when things like you say this outer and what we, you know, like I tell people when you smile and you smile at somebody, what do they usually do? Well, they're going to smile back because something happened right there a vibrational oh. spiritual law took place right there whether you recognize it or not so i love that you say that okay but you know what i love too is but you you know and i want you to talk about this because being altruistic being spiritual spiritually awakened and even aligned with the universe didn't just stop you from still pursuing other amazing ventures that give you a certain like I, i'm gonna say this like it's one thing to have the mercedes outside but it's another thing to have the mercedes outside and know that it comes from actually doing something that benefits society right so i know yes. that you and your wife have a company called elements truffles uh correct yes. And I wonder, do you get into business now with more of a mission focus and, you know, what you're doing with that? Does it that did that change the dynamic on how you saw corporate life versus like what you do now? And if you would you share on that? Yeah, it was a gradual happening. I mean, like how you said, you know, it doesn't have to um, make you feel bad about what you're doing or, you know, if, if you're in material world, it's absolutely fine. In fact, it was that practice of meditation that gave me the ability to take more risks. Um, it gave me the ability to really follow my heart. And it gave me the strength to go deep and rest so that I could come out and play harder in the world. And so right after I learned this, you know, soon after I, I, I left my corporate um, job uh, in, in finance um, and, you know, I started my I started on my own because I, I always wanted to um, explore entrepreneurship. Um, and one failed startup and two successfully acquired startups later, um, here I am on the fourth one where my wife and I, we wanted to really create something um, that had some meaning, that, had, that would create some impact. Um, and this was just a happening, a gradual happening that, that you know, we, we came to this understanding that you know, all this time we've been doing things, but it's not serving anyone else except ourselves. Um, so why don't we create something that makes a small impact, uh, even if it's an, in a minuscule way to the world around us. So we created this chocolate company. Uh, and again, there's something we really are passionate about um, with, with focus on redefining one's relationship with the food. You know, food is so central to everything we do whether it's a celebration or going for comfort, we turn to food. But somewhere along the way, our relationship with the food has become complicated. That simplicity has, has been lost. There's an element of guilt in it. There's an element of uh, regime that has come into it. So we, we thought we'll create, um, using this wonderful science of Ayurveda, which is a nutritional science uh, that supplements yoga, that goes back as 5,000 years back as yoga um, and we said using this simplicity the fundamental principles of ayurveda we bring that into our indulgences like so we started with chocolate because that's something so close to our hearts and we created a line of artisanal chocolates called elements truffles where the focus is on creating this wonderful yummy food but at the same time creating some sort of impact so we work directly with the farmers in Ecuador. There's no middlemen involved. So while they could be selling their producers at the price of a song to some big corporations, we actually, with, our, with the help of our local partner, we would send vehicles to these remote farms who not even have ability to send, you know, you know bring their producers to market. We send the trucks to, to get their produce uh, paying them much la larger share of for their produce compared to them selling it on some commodity market somewhere. Um, and once these products are, are imported here into United States, we produce this 
you know, very we, we, we indulge in a very mindful way of making it using, um, you know, sustainable pr practices, uh, very biodegradable, sustainable packaging. And then once it's, once it's kind of consumed, 25% of our profits go back into the community towards education of underprivileged children. So, so we, we wanted to create like an end-to-end -end story with an impact with, and, and, and a lot of heart in the supply chain um, from beginning to the end. So we're, you know, we're so happy. We're, we're so passionate and we're so proud of, of where we have come with that. I love it. When you were working, you know, at Goldman Sachs, did you ever think you'd have chocolate chocolatier under your <laughs> under your name? <laughs> Never, ever, ever. <laughs> but that's a beautiful My, thing, right? You you probably have learned through your meditation and unlocking, you know, th the sky really is the limit, like you said. Why not? Truly, truly, yeah. I mean, one thing I realized is that you know, at the end of the day, whatever we do, it doesn't matter. If we are not happy doing what we're doing, then it really doesn't matter what we do. So, so I'm like, okay, let's do something that A, makes us happy and B, makes some small minuscule impact in the world around us. Yes. And you are, you also have taught secrets of breathwork and meditation to thousands across the Europe. Europe, Asia, and U.S., you serve on the U.S. Board of the International Association for Human Values, which I bring up in still in correlation because, of course, we have uh, Human Rights Month. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's a lot of people around the world experience trauma for different reasons. Tell me about this experience. And so, you know, as we kind of in that moment talk about the breath work and meditation uh, and and how that benefits that community as well as everyone. And um, some of the myths that you get, some of the reasons people tell you they can't, why can't I, you know, like <laughs> what are the myths you're, you're always facing when people are like, well, I, I just, you know, I don't have meditation. I don't have time for that or something like that. You know? <laughs> yes. Two questions in one. So I'll yes. start with the it's double whammy. <laughs> yeah. So I, I started meditating and I thought I wanted to um, pay it forward. Um, I, I wanted to tell the world what I had experienced, what I really, um, if I could do it, everyone can. Um, and so I started um, paying my, you know, the skill forward by teaching it. Um, and that's how I started, you know, sharing this wisdom. And I had this opportunity, um, very grateful for that, to be able to serve on the board of IHV, uh, International Association for Human Values, where these techniques, these breathwork techniques, are taught in different walks of life. So we teach these techniques um, in prisons um, under this program called Prison Smart. We teach these techniques to the veterans who come back from war. Uh, we, we sh whenever there's a calamity or uh, a, a natural or you know, disaster, the, the, the volunteers of IHV go there um, and and kind of help people with their trauma relief through this breath work um, techniques, the sky breath meditation specific. Um, in fact, um, you started this conversation with reference to Sandy Hook. We are about a week away from uh, the 20th anniversary of Sandy Hook. And the IHV played a big role um, in, in teaching uh, sky breath meditation to the uh, survivors and and the parents uh, of of a Sandy Hook event. So, you know, it, it's it's something that has given a lot of meaning to 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 my um, to to what I do. Um, kind of added a different uh, dimension, texture to uh, to otherwise what I do in life. Um, but yeah, and and coming to the to the second part of your question, it's. Meditation can, can get boring, I understand, because it's not something like we're used to in this world. It does not give instant gratification. Yes, you may feel some sort of relaxation, you feel rejuvenated, but that rejuvenation or that relaxation wears thin very quickly the minute you pick up your cell phone and look at your um, social media or you go out in the world and talk to people and all that peace and calm immediately goes away. So it takes for that practice to settle in to the point where this feeling of calm that you experience 
stays longer. It becomes your second nature to the point where these kind of external uh, stimuli stop impacting you as deep as it would if you did not meditate. So when you don't see an instant benefit, you feel "Eh, it's a waste of time. Why am I doing right now? Maybe I'll do it later. It's no different from, from going to gym, right? You don't go to gym and the first day the muscles don't pop up. So he's like, all right, this is boring. I'll do it later. Um, so anything that's good for you, we have a tendency to, to push it out forward in some date in future. So that's why something I hear all the time is meditation. It's great, but, you know, I'm, I'm too busy right now. Or, or, you know, I sit for meditation and so many thoughts come. I can't meditate. It's not for me. Um, you know, so all these things that, I mean, I can so totally relate to them because I pass through all of them myself. Yeah. You know, you close your eyes and all these to-do lists pops up and all these things that are of utmost insignificance, like what am I going to have for dinner or where am I going to on my next vacation or how am I going to respond to my boss tomorrow? All these things come up and you feel like you're not able to meditate. And that is so natural because on one side, you're trying to push these thoughts away because we think that a state of meditation is devoid of thoughts, but it is not so meditation of thoughts are part of your meditation and the other thing is the more you push these thoughts away to chase that experience of calm the more they come back so there's this thing of wanting to experience that state of thoughtlessness and most of us try to get there using our own mind you know you, you get to that state of thoughtlessness by resisting it or by focusing on something. There, there are modalities of meditation where you focus on a sound or a, or a, or a visual. Um, but if you look, if you think about it, whether to not think of something or to think of something is all effort. It is all a frontal cortex activity of your brain. And when there is effort, the mind does not respond to it. The body responds to effort. You want to build muscles, you need effort. But you don't get rid of your thoughts, it has to be effortlessness. And this technique where I ended up after trying so many different techniques is the one where effortlessness took me there. When you are not really putting an effort to, to get to that experience. Right. Because there's nowhere to be. There's nothing to, to get to. Right. To, if you want to get to that nothingness, you need to use your breath as a as a pole vault to to transcend your thoughts right. and and that was this whole kind of concept of effortlessness that i stumbled upon and that was very refreshing i love that and you know also a lot of people i would add like to add that you know the it's a process like anything you you i love the illustration of going to the gym and to that point it takes a while so i found you know people often say well i can't get my thoughts to stop well you know, give it a couple weeks because even if you're looking for that peace and tranquility, it's the space in between the thoughts, right, that become greater as you sit more. And when I first started doing yoga, I didn't realize it was such a spiritual path. It was a, it's a practice. I didn't, I didn't see it as working out, and I saw it as conditioning my body and um, helping my body, and also just the way that meditation is is intricated in, or is integrated into it. You know, I did feel that high, but like you said, the minute I get home to my kids running around, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know. So yeah, in developing this invisible shield is what I've got now a little bit more, and it's a little bit thicker. So when I see their attitude, I'm like, it is bouncing off, you know. But it it takes a minute. Some days my shields down (laughs) absolutely and that's because to each one of us life happens differently and so your meditation every day is going to be different it's been almost 16 years and i've never had two same experiences of sky breath meditation every day it's different because it gives you what your system needs in that moment if you've gone through a very busy day and there's so much churning inside perhaps you need to get rid of those thoughts and those thoughts will come to, to leave you. Yeah. But if you've had a rather sort of, uh, you know, in the moment kind of in the flow kind of day, then you would probably sink in deeper. Right. So it's, it's all fine. It's just, you just, all you need to do is to commit to spend that 20 minutes to be with yourself. That's all. Yeah. And you know, I mean, do, do people often say, 
that they don't have time. And I find that an interesting term when people tell me I don't have time. I'm saying, no, you're choosing to not find time. Because like you just said, I mean, I honestly, sometimes even if my day is crazy and I didn't get, I, I, I'll lay in bed and just find myself finding space, finding, you know, time to meditate, even just laying in bed. I, I you know, I know that there's different ways, but my, my point is like just cognizantly doing that, I'm finding time in an otherwise day so that I don't say, oh, I don't have time technically, you know. Da Vinci had only 24 hours in a day yeah. too, right? I mean, who wants to sit and watch the breath or do sky breath when you can watch Netflix and have an instant sort of boost, right? I mean, or, or go out and enjoy some fine dinner or something like that. But, but I feel, you know, these two things are not mutually exclusive. You, you could do both. Right. Especially when the second one is so beneficial. So just really quick, you know, and, and I do want to share with you, is ask you to wrap your answer kind of in also, I think your book addresses a lot of this, you know, what are the benefits of the meditation, the breath work, the personal development, um, especially with regards to what you're providing in your amazing book on a wing and a prayer, you know, what, uh, how does that accomplish that? Or what are the benefits? Excuse me. So the, my book is an unfiltered account of my journey of, of looking at this whole uh, phenomenon of breathwork and meditation, first being skeptical about it, then being curious about it, and then having found out all these amazing scientific benefits, just jumping in. But, you know, I don't even know where to start. You know, the, the meditation has benefits at so many different levels of our system. At the physical level, you know, of course, your health improves um, in, in all the possible ways you can think of. There's more energy, there's more stamina, there is more, um, you know, there's just more enthusiasm to go about your day. It's, you just feel so ready. You feel so in the moment to, to take any challenge. But that's at the physical level. But if you think of, you go a little deeper, your, your sense of perception improves, your cognition improves. Your memory is becomes free of trauma. Your uh, sense of identity that oh that for me 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 that sense of ego that that kind of thins out. So you know there's all those different aspects of who we are, and meditation and breath work helps strengthen each of these. And at a subtler level, you know, any life experience that we go through, it leaves an impression in our system, whether good or bad, um, you know, whether it's a pleasant experience or an unpleasant impression, it leaves an impression. And whatever we do is kind of predicate on these impressions because these impressions create, as they get deeper, it creates repetitive behavior and that creates conditioning. And that's how we're going to show up in the world. So what happens is if, if not, dealt with these impressions kind of make who we really are um, creates the concepts in our minds and meditation and breath work um, sky breath in my case it cleanses our nervous system of these impressions so that makes you it takes you back to being childlike like when I mean, we look at kids you know they are free from impressions they are free they are their hard drive is still so empty Right. And that's why they are so irresistible. That's why they, they, they right. are, you know, they're so in the moment. They don't have to try to be in the moment. That's so um, true. That's so yeah. true. I love that. Um, OK, so before we get out of here, I, I do want to say thank you so much. I have a couple I've just to kind of, you know, line it up. I really appreciate <laughs> what you said. It's been incredible. We've, but we've got some rapid fire questions for you. Are you are you ready? They're not too hard. I didn't. Bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Would you rather sleep in late or take a long nap midday? Sleep in late. Sleep in the midday or sleeping in? Sleep in late. I, oh, sleeping sleep late. late. Oh, morning. perfect. Yeah, yeah. Sleeping late. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> do you kill bugs you find inside or take them outside? I take them outside and leave them. Oh, <laughs> you're such a kind soul. <laughs> what mythical creature would you believe was real? A mythical creature. I've never thought about it. I think Gandalf. Gandalf the Grey from Lord <laughs> of the Rings. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> That's so funny because I had a Harry Potter question option and I didn't put it because I was like, well, what if he doesn't know Harry Potter? <laughs> <laughs> right? okay. I'm not a Potterhead. I'm more of a 
Lord of the Rings guy but, or Star Wars guy, but oh, we'll see. <laughs> Clearly, um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so we, are, we are in sync there. <laughs> yeah, I'm. You know, forgive me. I, I, I can talk better about the Lakers. No kidding. <laughs> <Just> kidding. <laughs> um, okay. So, what object do you misplace or lose the most? My glasses. <laughs> do you lose them when they're on your head? <laughs> not on the head. I just lose them, and it's so hard to find them when you not have them on. So yes. It's a self-perpetuating problem. I totally know what you mean. I'm like, <laughs> my my husband laughs at me. He's like, what are you looking for? My glasses, but I can't find them. <laughs> so I feel you. Okay. Would you rather travel to the past or to the future? It was up to me neither. <laughs> I'll be right where I am. Ah, that was perfect. I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, for our listening audience, Kushal, where can they find you, support you, you know, buy your chocolate? Um, my website, kushalchoksi.com, has all the information about my book. You find it on Amazon, perhaps in a store near you. Um, my chocolates on elementstruffles.com. Um, uh, okay. But yeah, love to connect with you. Um, hit me up on my social media handles um, on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. Um, and if you ever get a chance to read my book, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think about everything. Uh, and if you can relate to it even more, please let me know. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I do need to go leave a comment, by the way, myself. So I, I just want to say <laughs> I appreciate your time. Your story is tremendous. Your energy is by you know a vibrational refreshing course i feel you know it's just it's so pleasant so i look forward to being in new york and seeing you if you're ever in la you definitely have to connect um, absolutely but, would love to see you in person but thank you so much for your time and we'll see you soon thank you thanks for having me again thank you and to the audience at home i just want to say thank you i hope you've gained something you heard those benefits if you haven't engaged some yoga some breath work some meditation maybe you should give it a try honestly we want nothing but the best for you stay tuned for the next episode and thank you so much for letting us be unsugarcoated take care bye bye What are you still doing here? Come back next week.